Hello and welcome back. If you follow the channel, you know that we just opened up an early Soviet space clock during a live stream. The clock flew in the very first Soyuz spacecraft, and surprisingly also in the Buran shuttle, and is entirely electromechanical. This beauty had been loaned to us by noted space collector Steve Jervison. Except for two rather minor repairs, a jamming stopwatch start-stop button, which was taken care of with a single drop of oil, and an oxidized stopwatch actuator contact, which just needed a little bit of burnishing, it was in excellent condition. We were able to carefully bring it back to life in the previous episode. Actually, we had it ticking away with extreme precision, as we derived our driving pulses from a Hewlett-Packard atomic clock reference. That should give it a precision of one second every 3200 years. Of course, everybody commented that it's very loud. And I can confirm, it really is. Particularly when the clock is opened. It's also interesting to compare it to its successor, this incredibly complicated digital Soyuz clock, which we restored previously. As you'll see, the analog clock compares pretty favorably, and some might argue that this is actually the better one of the two. Let's first decipher the Cyrillic markings. For that, I enlisted the help of Archem Kashkanov. If you hop over to his channel, you'll realize that he must be my long-forgotten Russian cousin. Hi everyone, my name is Artyom Kashkanov and I'm making crazy electronic stuff from the parts which should not be used in the 21st century. He does such crazy things as building computers from Soviet relays, reviving old plasma Soviet displays, and playing with Soviet tubes. I'll put a link in the description. It's all in beautiful Russian, of course, but the caption auto-translate does a good job at letting you follow along. Mark asked me to pronounce Russian labels on his Soyuz Soviet clock. Unfortunately, I don't have a real one in my collection, but I printed a photo of it. Время полета. Flight time, сутки, часы, минуты, days, hours, minutes, секундомер, chronometer, сброс на ноль, clear to zero, часы, минуты, секунды, hours, minutes, seconds. Изделие включить, device turn on, пуск, останов, сброс, start, stop, clear or reset. Оповещение включить. Alarm on. Часы, минуты. Hours, minutes. Оповещатель. Alarm. Секунды, seconds. And there we go. Isn't Russian a beautiful sounding language? I can't wait that he gets a French space clock so I can return him the favor. So it's pretty much what you expect in alarm clock, a chronometer and a flight totalizer. And then on the back, uh, there is quite a large connector. It's a 19 pin one and we'll see that we can do quite a bit with that. It's the same connector that we have on our digital clock but it's wired differently. And looking at the main alarm clock dial here, uh, the first thing you notice is that it's not a traditional uh, 12 hour dial, it's a 24 hour dial, which of course it quite important in space because when you're orbiting the, the Earth it's pretty hard to tell what's night and what's day. And this is the manual advance. It takes two clicks to uh, advance a second. So it's half second resolution and right there that's more than the digital clock which only of course shows seconds. Uh, also the digital, digital clock inherited the drive from the mechanical one so it needs to be driven with two ticks per second uh, at two hertz. And obviously it just uh, inherited from this, which needs two clicks to do one second. The button next to it sets the uh, alarm and you can only move it in one direction. So the next button here has actually two functions. When you press it in, there you go. It's the time adjust and you can adjust it in Two directions. There is a little bidirectional arrow, arrow that tells you you can do so. And to get out of the adjustment mode, you need to press on the seconds button. When it's out and 
the second hand is around zero and only when it's there, then it has another function where if you turn it, it advances the totalizer over here. And the way the totalizer moves is independent of the direction in which you turn the button. It always goes up. And another interesting oddity that I wanted to show is when we have a one, so I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little dot to uh, the right uh, hand side on the bottom of the one. The minute does have it, the tens of minute doesn't have it, the hour doesn't have it. But interestingly, the day totalizer also have the same one with the dot. I'll insert some footage of when I had it take over. And I have no clue why that is. That is so weird. And a couple of commenters took exception that I could only modify the totalizer when the second hand was close to zero. And, you know, just uh, said with authority that the clock is broken. But I don't think that's the case. I think this is actually how it's meant to be. It's a feature. So for example, if I move the hand over here, it's not advancing anymore. And the reason is, is for uh, safety. So you don't inadvertently uh, change the time on your uh, mission totalizer unless you really want to get here, stop the clock, and then change the mission time. So the next switch is just alarm on off. Then we come to the uh, chronometer. Uh, they made it so it's very easy to operate. And I just went through the reset. Start, stop, reset. And this one has an hour totalizer, which is more than the digital clock. If you look at the digital clock over here, it has just uh, seconds and minutes. Uh, however, the minutes goes past 60 right here. It's at 87, so it will count to 99. But still, once again, it appears that the mechanical clock does more than the digital one. And then the next button is just clock on off. So it just turns it on. And now my chronometer is going to work. right? that's on stop clear and uh, some commenters were distraught that i didn't show the minute hand advance but i did show it it advances it just doesn't jump uh, it goes progressively so it's almost at one and you'll see that when it goes past uh, uh, 60 seconds nothing happens so it's only stepwise here in half seconds and everything here is just analog continuous rotation. And finally, the last button is the reset for the mission counter. And this one, it takes a fair effort to get it going. And same thing is on purpose, right? When they want it easy, they make a push button. When they want to make it a deliberate action, they'll, they'll do something like this. If it were a push button, you could reset it by accident. So lots of thought put in this uh, small interface for the clock. When it was time to open our clock, we had to deal with two tamper-proof screws, the same issue we also had with our digital clock. Also note the yellowish area around the screws. We were told this is beeswax used to seal them. Talking about seals, there is a seal embossed on the tamper-proof screws. We were discussing them online when Archem dropped in just at the right moment. So here was the seal. So, and he says what? This is means compliant? Can you, can you see the second one now? Yeah, it's like a Pi 3, 7, something like that. Hey, here's Artem when, when we need him. So what does it mean? Can you say it in Russian? Отдел технического контроля. Этот сил – это output control department. Yeah, uh, this seal can make have very different variants because it's uh, kind of unique for every, any manufacturers. So it can mean some uh, external control. Uh, uh, department number seven. There, uh, 
there are a lot of different variants for the second seal. So I first had to tamper with the tamper-proof screws, which is not that difficult as the compound is rather soft. I use a combo of a handheld end mill and some dental tools to get to the screws. And we soon were in like Flynn. All right. That's cool. Wow. So it's quite an impressive mechanism. You can tell it's been made for space use and vibration and acceleration resistance. Everything is overbuilt, all the screws are locked in the green varnish. The most obvious concession to uh, space flight is what's not there. There is no uh, movement to, so the clock can advance by itself. The only way you can operate the clock is with those electromagnets. Uh, there's one for the clock. I can make it work right here. And there is one for the chronometer. So it's really in electronic or electromechanical clock. It needs the timing is derived from elsewhere and it just counts and displays it. Compared to a traditional watch, the gears are super beefy and you can see they, they are all machine. There's nothing stamped. So this is a traditional watchmaker lathe gears. Nice and strong. This is a closer view of the drive ratchet. There are three adjustment points. The lift amount, which is the green screw at the top. The end travel, that would be the screw at the top right, also green. And also the rest position uh, would be the screw at the bottom in this other view. Another neat looking part is the clutch for the two position air adjustment knob. When it is engaged with the knob down, it adjusts the main clock time and you disengage it by pressing the second advance button. People on the live stream also notice the second advance button, which uses a conical part to advance the second ratchet. And finally, the last coil is this solenoid that pulls the chronometer mode button with it. So if we do it, and this will get the chronometer started, stopped and reset. This uh, chronometer mode is attached to a set of contacts which were misidentified by many commenters. As we'll see later, these are not slave clock contacts, but three contacts that serve to implement an electromechanical state machine for the chronometer remote control, plus a fourth one that parallels the chronometer coil to the main clock to get the chronometer going. Uh, more on this later. The tidiness of the electrical wiring is very impressive. I'm not sure what they are wrapped in, maybe silk? And we found a similar quality of workmanship in the digital clock also. So this is how my driving setup works. The base frequency comes from the cesium clock, the uh, atomic frequency standard, so precise one second every 3200 years. And the output of that over here comes all the way up and drives this piece of equipment, which uh, we saw in another video. And that's a pulsar timer. So it will give us a pulse every half second. And I am actually measuring it right here. And you see it uh, as far as this instrument can tell. It, we are a few more decimals behind this. Uh, and so, but that gives me sh like short ticks. You see them here. so. And here are the ticks generated by this box over here. This then every pulse, is, it triggers this. And this uh, allows me to have complete control of the pulse. And in particular, I can change the pulse width here. It's written pulse width. So if you look at this, I'm just making it bigger. There you go, here are the larger pulse width. And then that in turn drives an amplifier uh, which brings them to 28 volts so if we turn that one on the pulses come out and you can you can see them in blue down here and so right now it's driving just the clock and if i press 
the chronometer mode button it will go into driving both the clock and the chronometer via this contact by repair so this is just closed and it puts those two in parallel so now as far as the sound uh, here I'm giving it short pulses I'm going to vary that so here it is making longer pulses and that's about 50% duty cycle so it doesn't affect of course how the clock moves so I don't know if that is a better sound than this that's how I was driving it then you, you can make it the other way around and it's basically the same sound so these are long pulses I wouldn't recommend that because you're just hitting the coils a lot more anyhow all the settings are similarly loud but I believe I did set it right with the shorter pulses that minimize the coil heating what would be the most interesting part of the mechanism the chronometer and the uh, totalizer it's in the thickness of the bezel, uh, so there's almost nothing here. It all happens uh, behind the, the bezel here, uh, which is a little bit of a pain to remove. Another nice detail I uh, found out when trying to remove the buttons. So you, you'd think you, you would be done once you had unscrewed that, but no. You have to unscrew it this way. So it's both screwed on the thread over here and then locked in place by a, a side screw. Uh, and I believe it's the same over here. And I thought they would all be the same, except that when I came to this one, this one is different. There's one screw this way. another screw this way and it comes out and those are different screws they, they go there's a little hole and you know, they go and poke through the hole and I was wondering what why why didn't do, they do the same and the reason is is that uh, these buttons you turn them only clockwise so when you turn them clockwise it will make them tighter but this one has two directions so there would be a chance remote I suppose that if uh, it slips you would untighten it so they went to with a, a different way to lock it in place that's not dependent on directions so i finally managed to remove the last button which i couldn't do during the live stream or didn't dare to do and it's just pressed in it just has a spring attached to it and you can see it's a it's a split thing that should allow us to remove the top cover there you go so here we have it, that's the inside. I don't think we're going to be able to see anything. That's a glass plate. Yeah, this is screwed in, the, the hole. This is metallic. And then, yeah, we see the gasket. But we don't see much of the mechanism either so yeah so the uh, seeing the mechanism for the chronometer would would uh, necessitate to remove this plate which is of course way too dangerous so I'm not going to do that but uh, if the collector wants the thing cleaned up we can do that I, I wouldn't do it I'm just going to clean the glass it's just natural patina in the item it's history. And here's the result of uh, beeping, beeping the clock out. Uh, it looks horrible like this, but when it unfolds, it's actually much more readable like that. 
So looking over here, you have the three coils, the clock, the chronometer, and the mode button. And they are all tied to the same common, which, which is accessible through the clock on switch in front of the clock. So if that one is off, there's really nothing you can actuate from uh, the exterior. Uh, and if you look at the clock coil, that's the main input for the clock pulses. Uh, and the chronometer coil can be either actuated on its own output, it has a pin for it, or in automatic mode when the mode button of the chronometer is on a start, then those two are put in parallel. That This is actually the, the contact we burnished, that's the one that had the high resistance. On this side the alarm is also very simple, here's the alarm contact driven by the clock, so you can access it between pin 1, 2 and 8, or you can access it through a switch that's on the front face uh, if you wanted to disable the alarm between pin 1, 2 and pin 7, 12, which leaves us with the mode button of the chronometer. So I was activating it on pin 5 and 6 to my power supply, and before I made a schematic, I thought these three were uh, position sensing, they are, but I think they were just to report the position. Uh, this one is closed uh, when it's reset, this one is closed when it's stopped, this one is closed when it's start. But then I expected them to be tied to the common and they are not. So those are not reporting buttons, those are actually uh, used to implement a mechanical state machine. So uh, here, if you put a switch here, it will go through all the three positions. But if you put a switch over here, and give it pulses, it will only work to, do, to go to the next step. I'll demonstrate that in a second. So I have now connected the clock to my ground support equipment Apollo style box with the uh, Apollo buttons, the twist lights and the rototel lights that we built in the previous episode. And every single wire is connected, so it takes quite a few. Uh, 19 wires, also some are redundant, and they come out here on three cat fives. And then I use the uh, block 66 uh, jumper block to uh, punch a wiring that connects it to no less than uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten buttons. No, nine buttons and four indicators to uh, exercise all the functions. Plus, over here, a sound system for the alarm, the power supply, and the clock input from my clock generator. So let me demonstrate. Uh, the chronometer, previously I had operated uh, by cycling it through the solenoid. So start, starting, stop, and reset. And I have added the little lights that are connected to the three contacts I have talked about before. So they, they move through the states. But what those contacts are really used for is to implement a little uh, state machine. So we can have independent start, stop and reset buttons. For example, when I am in a reset, stop, and reset won't do anything, only the start button that goes through the reset contact will advance us to the next state. So I can do start and it advances us to the next state. And same thing, I cannot go straight to the reset or start. Here the only state I can go through is the one that goes to that contact and that's the stop button uh, wired through this. So this will only do stop. And then I can go through reset again and, and you, you, you cannot go the other way around and you can tell that this is exactly what they have re-implemented on the electronic clock. So the electronic clock has the same start stop reset state machine that's inspired from the electromechanical one. So if I do clear, nope. I have to go stop, clear, yeah, so same thing, it only works if you do start, then stop, then reset. You cannot do start, reset, that doesn't work, 
the one thing they have added though on the digital one is that um, no, there's the cycle button here and that gets locked out as soon as you touch the remote button so if I do start I cannot stop it anymore the, the, the spaceship has control over it so that's that's something that they don't have in the mechanical one so I could absolutely start it from the rocket ship and if I want I can stop it manually and potentially have an error so another thing I have gained is the independent control of the chronometer too so if I go to start and stop so I can send it independent pulses and advance it independently of the clock. Uh, the only use I could think of uh, would be a chronometer restart so in normal mode the clock does that for you so when you start it it used the force contact to couple the two solenoids when you stop it it decouples it but now that I have access to the extra solenoid I have a, a third mode where I can restart the chronometer independently so I do continue and this one will restart or continue its count without going through the forced resets that the cycle would force us to so I can stop it then wait for a few seconds adjust it if I want it and I won't do that and then restart it and finally the last function is the alarm and I've connected the alarm to two things I have a little alarm indicator here and I also have my little sound generator so let's set it to actually we should we should do midnight <laughs> it's pretty close and wait for it so here we go midnight turn the alarm sound on and by the way I think I have found the original sound that was the alarm sound that was used in the Soyuz clock and that uh, had been lost to history so uh, let's wait for midnight and you'll hear it so it's coming on pretty close 30 seconds till midnight and I will see how precise it is I actually don't have any idea Size and you heard the original Soyuz alarm clock. I tried to turn it off, that didn't work. <laughs> Let's see for how long it, it lasts. I think it lasts about 30 seconds when I tried it last time. There you go, 30 seconds. So here you have it, you've learned a previously little known fact that the cuckoo clock sound was obviously copied by the Germans after a Soyuz spacecraft crash landed in the Black Forest. So, so on some parting words, it's, it's a very impressive little clock. Now obviously the digital one has the added precision of the alarm uh, to the second, which is you know, of course a big advantage. The other big advantage it has is that it can run on its own, which it's doing right now, also it's not super precise. Uh, this one cannot do that. If the master clock source in the ship is gone, uh, you have no time anymore. Uh, and then finally, the obvious <laughs> advantage is that it's, you know, finally you, you would get, you get away from the infernal tick-tock of the mechanical one. Other than that, the mechanical one, is very impressive it's 
smaller, it's lighter, and it seems to have more functionality than its uh, later digital cousins. So give a hand for the Soyuz clock. I hope you enjoyed it and see you in the next episode.